Figure it out. Hello, this is Adam Korlick with Figure It Out Productions. The following video is part of our quick shoot series. Hey guys, it's Adam here, and check it out, I've got a package. The, this comes from the UK and was purchased specifically by a guy named Corey Marsh. Now that name might sound familiar, it's not to be confused with Corey Marshall, the guy who did the voice of uh, Rio over there in Shenmue. Um, no, Corey Marsh, uh, you might, again, you might recognize his name. He is a Patreon backer of mine, and he pops up in every one of my podcasts because he's at the level where he gets to pick a, uh, a subject that I talk about. In addition to doing that, he just decided to send this to me out of nowhere, and I told him no, he didn't have to do that. Of course he did it, and well, thank you for that. And I hope you guys will thank him too, because without him doing that, we couldn't possibly do this video. So I'm just going to go ahead and open it up, and we will talk talk more about what it is. Uh, so rip open the tape there, cut it. Uh, again, this comes from the, um, the UK. I think these are originally made in Norway, but I think they're shipped out of the UK. So inside, here we go, we got a couple of things. We got first the main unit, this thing, and some other stuff. Let me just get that and then we'll move this thing out of the way. Uh, so first of all, we have the power supply. Uh, which is kind of cool. It's like a little universal power supply and it comes with these multinational adapters depending on what part of the world you're in. I'm in the United States, so I will be using the North American adapter. We'll put that off to the side. It also comes with a remote control, which we will take a look at here as soon as I get it out of the wrapping. Uh, it's worth noting there are multiple ways to get this. You can get the uh, unit, the device, pre-assembled or you can get it uh, in pieces and put it, yourself, put it together yourself. The purpose of doing that would be to uh, save on cost. It would be cheaper to build it yourself. Uh, but in the meantime, take a look at this. This is the remote control. Does not have batteries. Clearly we'll need them. It's kind of an odd looking remote. I think it's kind of a universal remote. I don't think this was specifically built for this machine, but yeah, I'm not sure. It also comes with instructions, which I might take a look at later. And then we have the device itself, which we are going to open up here. Inside we have this. Uh, a bag within a bag. Bag exception. There's an old meme. Okay, uh, yeah, here it is. This is the device. This is the OSSC. It stands for the Open Source Scan Converter. Now, if you're like, what the hell is this? Why are we watching this? Sorry, I took so long to get to this point. But basically, the grossest, simplest explanation of what this is, is it's a device where you connect your old game consoles to it, then you connect it to your TV, and it makes your old game consoles look a lot better on your modern television. There you go, that's the simple explanation. Obviously it's more complicated, there's more to it than that, but that's in layman's terms what it basically is. Um, so it, it's comparable to things like, say, the Framemeister. Now I did a video on the Framemeister a while back, you can check it out for all the details. Uh, there's also cheaper versions like the SCART to HDMI box, I did a video on that as well. This is the same basic concept. Now if you're wondering, you know, like why would you do this one as, uh, as well, well again it's because Corey hooked me up so I thought it'd be kind of cool to talk about it for all you guys. But also the thing with this is that it has certain advantages and probably disadvantages as compared to the Framemeister. Most notably, the Framemeister, as, even though it's the Rolls Royce of these type of boxes, it's very expensive. It's a $400 device and that's when they were in production. They've now since been discontinued and because of that they're often being resold now for like upwards to $1,000 US. This is substantially cheaper. This is about 160 pounds, I think, pre-assembled, which is around $200 US, something like that. So that's a much better deal. But is it worth it? Is it good? Is it bad? I don't know. I haven't used it yet. But uh, I can tell you by looking at it, there's definitely some other advantages and disadvantages to it. So let's take a quick look at it, and then after that I'll, I'll go ahead and actually use it and check it out. Now, uh, it has, uh, right here, it has a power supply, all, uh, and of course we have a power cable, so that makes perfect sense. Um, it has a switch on it that of course activates or deactivates the device. It has three different types of input options, which is cool. Um, the Framemeister had five. However, one of them was totally useless. It offered HDMI in, but it was really just a convenience thing. It didn't really do anything with that. It was just to give you back an, an HDMI port that it itself was using. Uh, it also, but it also had composite, it had S-video, it had component. Granted, that was through D-terminal, so it was kind of inconvenient. And it had RGB, but it also needed a proprietary little RGB uh, cable for that to work. But those were its options. This is slightly different in that it does not have composite and it does not have S-video. Uh, but it does have VGA, which is surprising. You, you very rarely see one that has VGA on board. Um, now VGA is, is kind of a novelty, honestly, with game consoles. There's only two game consoles, to my knowledge, where their best video output is through VGA, therefore would actually benefit from this device. The first one would be my favorite console of all time, the Sega Dreamcast. But I will tell you right now, 
if you're thinking about getting this for your Dreamcast, I would say hold off. I can tell you there's definitely something better coming, So, we'll, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a different video. The only other console I know of that uses VGA for its best output is the Apple Pippin. A console most people don't even know is real, much less actually have. Now, I have one. I've even done a video on that as well, so it does exist. I can promise you that. But those are the only two consoles that would actually really benefit from this. Uh, and one of the massive disadvantages of it, just by looking at it, is it doesn't have input for the sound for VGA. We'll talk more about that in a bit. Uh, that's part of why these cables are here. Uh, next up, it has component input. Also really cool. The Framemeister, like I said, it had component, but it used D-terminal. D-terminal is basically the Japanese version of component. It's a completely different port, but it's essentially the same thing. And you, what you would do is you'd get this little adapter, you'd plug into the D-terminal port, and then you'd plug your component cables into it. That's how it worked. Um, it was an extra step, but it worked. Although the Framemeister, in all honesty, doesn't handle component all that nicely. But again, with component, there's only four consoles that really benefit from component. The Nintendo GameCube, um, assuming you have the component cables, the Wii, the PlayStation 2, and the original Xbox. So again, you're talking about, with those two ports combined, you're talking about six consoles that can really take advantage of that. And once again, just looking at it, same problem, they didn't include sound ports for either of them. Okay. Uh, and then finally, the third one, RGB SCART. Now this is the meat and potatoes. This is the reason you would get this device. The others are just icing on, icing on the cake. You don't necessarily need them. RGB SCART is the one you really care about. Now, here's, here's a little breakdown for you, especially if you're in North America, because I know we got deprived of this uh, back in the 90s. Most of your 90s consoles, um, things like the Super Nintendo, the Sega Genesis, what have you, uh, in, those consoles support a format called RGB. Basically, all the games are rendered in RGB red, green, blue. And in Europe, they had a cable known as SCART, and if it was connected to those ca those consoles and it was supporting RGB, for example, they use the Super Nintendo over there, and they use an RGB SCART cable, they plug into their TV, it just passes the RGB straight through, and you get this nice, clean picture on your television. Yay. In North America, we didn't have that. We had composite, because we had nothing, we didn't have SCART, and we had nothing the equivalent of SCART. We had lesser cables. So when the system is rendering the game in RGB and then it sees that you're connecting the console through composite, it goes, well, I, okay, fuck, um, I'll just make it worse. It sends it through this little transcoder chip that it is inside the console. It degrades the image so that it can pass through composite. That's why, especially now, if you hook up a composite device uh, console to your modern television, you're like, oh, good God, do not want. That's what, that's what ends up coming out of that. The logic here is that if you were to take your Super Nintendo or your Sega Genesis, what have you, and buy the Euroscart RGB cables, you could plug them into your console, no modification required, and then plug it into this, and then plug this into your TV, and you'll get all the benefits of RGB, plus all the benefits of this actual box. At least that is the logic. Um, and I can tell you, having used other devices similar to this, it's usually pretty worth it, especially with things like the Framemeister. Um, but this one, um, here's where we get to the next possible issue with this device. You get to the output. So with the, with the Framemeister, or the SCART to HDMI device, it's kind of obvious what you can output with HDMI. This uses DVI, doesn't use HDMI. And that's really, really unfortunate. Now, I, I got why they did this. Um, it has to do with licensing. HDMI is not free. You have to pay to use it as a, a feature. Now, I'm not sure if DVI is open source or if it's just substantially cheaper, but I know that's the reason they went with it. I just, it, was, it was a haircut on how expensive the thing would be to produce. Um, now, DVI is kind of the bastard cousin of HDMI. They're essentially the same exact video format. It's just that DVI traditionally doesn't have sound. It's also obviously a different pinout, but that's why you would get something like this. This is a DVI to HDMI cable. There's no hardware in this, really. It's just a direct connection. It just pops out there because the video signal is essentially identical. But while DVI is technically capable of supporting sound, this particular device does not support sound. Hence, they put on a 3.5 millimeter audio jack. So here's, without even using it, I can already tell you that that is really frustrating because when you look at it, you can see that sound was very much an afterthought. VGA doesn't have it. Component doesn't have it. SCART probably has it because otherwise this 3.5 millimeter audio jack is truly useless. Um, actually, it says right on here that RGB is AVI-1 and it says audio is strictly for AVI-1. So there you go. It only supports audio through RGB. Uh, and then you have the, the digital video out. Basically what I'm saying is to use this thing, you're going to run into some issues. Um, now, personally, I checked my TV. 
My TV does not have a DVI port on it, so I'm going to have to use this thing. At the same time, um, my TV happens to have one HDMI port that does happen to have an additional uh, audio port on the side, but it's not 3.5 millimeter, it's RCA. So what does that mean? It means I need to take this, a series of cables right here. This is a 3.5 millimeter male to male extension cord, so I have to plug this in there. Then that comes to the end and I have to plug it into this little adapter that's 3.5 millimeter female to whatever that bigger uh, audio cable is male. Plug that into this adapter, which takes the female version of that and then gives you the uh, RCA audio. All of this shit just to get sound, and that's just because I happen to have a TV that happens to have an HDMI port that happens to have additional audio capabilities. Most TVs and monitors don't have that. That is definitely an Achilles heel of this device, is that the sound aspect of it was definitely not something they really thought too much about. It's clearly meant more for the video features. So this is recommended more for people with a separate sound system or that just happen to get lucky and happen to have audio, extra audio ports like I do. The same thing would be said for the component ports. You know, you plug your three com video component cables in there and then you have these extra audio cables like, well, what do I do with them? Well, realistically, you're not going to be able to like shove them into the television and then put this next to the television, so you're going to need some sort of extension cord. So you're going to plug the two audio cables into an adapter thing like this and then plug extra set of um, audio cables into your television. It's just, you see what I'm saying? It's just a bunch of extra crap you have to do. And personally, I would have preferred to pay the extra expense, and granted, obviously, in this case, Corey bought it, but I, if I were to buy it, personally, I would have paid the extra money to have those things, because you ultimately have to buy all this extra shit or just be massively inconvenienced. I mean, maybe that's not the same for everyone. Maybe people have different sound setups and they, they don't have a problem with that kind of thing, but personally, to me, that's kind of a big... Um, that's kind of a big deal. I thought I'd give you a little close-up uh, mini review of this remote. Uh, obviously, as mentioned before, it's kind of a universal cheapo remote, but that's fine. It gets the job done. Uh, I didn't find myself needing this for the purposes of, like, gameplay or anything. You know, switching between devices was easy enough with this. This is really more for the purposes of uh, messing around with the menu. Now, this thing has all sorts of different options inside of it, changing settings, all that, including updating firmware, which we're actually going to do here in just a moment. But uh, to kind of finalize my review of this, it's comfortable enough. You know, there's no, no issues there. Unfortunately, it uses AAA batteries, which really sucks because those I, I never have those lying around. You have to find them in other devices and all that stuff, but whatever. For the purposes of this, it's okay. Um, now, to update the firmware, we're going to do that real quick here. Uh, there is a micro SD card slot there, and uh, to do this, you have to download a firmware file, and you basically have to flash it to the SD card. There are other guides and videos out there that uh, show you how to do that. One, it's really easy, um, as provided you have Windows-based technology, uh, as in not a Mac. I don't know what you'd have to do if you had a Mac. But uh, if you have Windows-based stuff, once you format it and all that fun stuff, you put it on there, you put the micro SD card in there, which I'm fairly certain has to be small. This is a 2 gigabyte. SD card. I Generally, stuff like this, if you have cards bigger than that, they won't read it, they won't work. I'm just guessing. I'm pretty sure it won't work with anything uh, bigger than 2 gigs, but I could be wrong. Um, but anyway, so to update it, first we turn it on here. Now you can take a look at it and it says OSSE firmware 0.73. That's what's on there currently. Now the plan is to put 0.75 on there, which is what is the most recent update at the time I make this video. So to do that, we take our remote here and uh, we press menu and you can see it uh, changes to video in uh, process, I guess. Anyway, we're just gonna cycle down uh, until we get to firmware, okay? And now we just click on that. It says it's validating, so it read it. It says 0 0.75, update, one yes or two for no. Well, we obviously wanna update it, so I'm gonna go ahead and hit one, and it's gonna update the firmware. See, please wait. Verifying flash, and update, press okay, please restart. Uh, so we go ahead and turn it off, turn it back on, and now, as you can see, OSSC firmware 0.75. So we have successfully updated the firmware. The menu interface on this thing is not complicated. It has two buttons and a little screen. Now the function of the button here on the left is to allow you to switch between AV input 1, which is the SCART, AV input 2, which is component, AV input 3, which is VGA. And each one of those has like a little subsect of options depending on what kind of cables you have. It has different uh, options to detect different type of signals. The, uh, the second button here is for scan lines. Uh, it's a scan line generator, so it can make you know thin lines, thick lines, or just turn them off. Personally, I hate scan lines, so I just completely turned it off. Now, I would love, 
absolutely love to be able to sit here and tell you, yeah, man, fuck the Frame Meister. This thing is the way of the future. You don't need the Frame Meister. This is a cheaper, better alternative in every conceivable way. I can't say that because it's not true. <laughs> um, so this thing is good. Don't get me wrong. It, it produces a high grade image and uh, it, it, it's awesome in a lot of ways, but it just has so many quirks. Now, as a result of those quirks, this is going to be for a lot of people with very specific setups. Sadly, I'm not one of them. Now, the biggest issue I already talked about for quite a bit, which is the audio problems. You know, it doesn't have onboard audio, so it has additional requirements when you want to try and set it up, which is very annoying to say the least. Now, if you're the kind of person who generally has like a small workspace that you generally use the same computer monitor for everything and like you just want to integrate stuff into that system and you probably have separate speakers if you have that kind of setup this is probably the device for you but if you're like me where you have all your stuff kind of in a living room set up where you're you know the TV's over there and all the consoles are on one side and you know you're playing in a chair on the other side and all that and your speakers are mostly integrated into the television this is not for you um, so let's let's talk about that. That first of all, that that is the first big issue. And when I was thinking about doing this, I was like, okay, well, I'm going to record footage off of this thing, and I'll show people comparisons of what all the different consoles look like when you uh, connect them through all the different cables. Like that was my plan. I've done that before with things like the Frame Meister video, as mentioned before. Then I realized I can't do that because uh, there's no way to capture audio from this thing, at least not with my hardware, because my recording devices only have HDMI input, which means I could get an HDMI signal out of this thing with you know the appropriate adapter thing over here, but there would be no way to get sound out of it. I was like, okay, well, I'll still do it, and I'll just explain, you know, I can't get the sound, etc. But my device also did not like the video signal coming off of this thing. As a result, I couldn't capture any video quality, any video off of this thing. I know, I know, I know, it sucks. I agree, it sucks. So if you want to see what the potential is for doing things like upgrading from composite to S-Video, S-Video to RGB, etc., please check out my FrameMeister video because I didn't have problems like that. Now, if you're curious why that is, uh, the FrameMeister, frankly, is a smarter device when it comes to this type of thing. Let me explain. If you have something like, let's say, the Super Nintendo, it outputs a resolution at uh, 240p. Now, if you were to connect that to a television, uh, through just say composite cables. Your TV doesn't understand 240p. So it just looks at that and it goes, okay, I can't really read that, but um, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna upscale that to 480i. And that's why it looks so bad because not only is it just stretching the image, it's also adding needless deinterlacing. Uh, so as a result, it looks a lot worse than it should. So when you connect it to something like this, the idea is to alleviate that and to get the true RGB quality out of it, not even like the horrible compression that the uh, composite puts into it. But with, this, with the Frame Meister, it'll look at that 240p signal and say, okay, I see that pixel looks like this. Let me just redraw that whole pixel all the way up here. Let me grab the next one, redraw it up here. And it'll make a very standard output resolution of like 720p or 1080p, depending upon what you have it set at. Because it's a standard output, recording devices don't have a problem with it. At least not mine didn't. This device operates differently. It basically takes the input resolution that it detects and it just kind of generically doubles it. And it does that well. But that means there's a lot of oddball combinations of resolutions that can come off of this thing. Unfortunately for me, my recording software did not like it. And it also means that depending on your TV or monitor, you may have compatibility issues. So let me go through the first, my first experience with this thing. I set it all up, even though it was a lot of different wires, a lot of different shit hanging off this thing. I got it all con connected together, and I connected the, uh, the Sega Genesis to it. Turned it on, nothing. The TV wouldn't show it at all. Now I know it was working because this little screen here, which by the way is a really nice feature, this little LCD screen, uh, it tells you uh, what input you're on and it tells you like data and information about whatever signal it's detecting. It was detecting the Genesis. So it knew the Genesis was coming in. The problem is it was taking the oddball output resolution of the Genesis and just doubling it. And my TV was like, I don't know what the fuck you want me to do with this it couldn't detect that. Now, if you connect it to a different monitor, it might read it just fine. Um, so that, that's kind of annoying. It's another one of those things, again, your results may vary. So that was unfortunate. Uh, then I connected it to the Sega Saturn. Sega Saturn worked just fine. Now, oddly, that, since that was the first console I got to work with it, uh, the Sega Saturn was displayed 16 by 9, meaning the image was being stretched. 
I was surprised by that because, well, obviously it's a 4x3 console. Now, the cheap start to HDMI box does that. On my TV, I press a couple buttons and I can put it back down to 4x3 and make it look normal. Um, but, yeah, uh, if, we're, if the recording had worked, it would have captured in 16x9, which would have been annoying. The FrameMeister allows you to permanently change that with a, uh, like a flick of a switch. This device apparently does not, at least not that I could find, which was unfortunate. Regardless, though, the Sega Saturn actually looked really good. It looked very clean. I was, the quality off of it was quite nice once you got past all that stuff. Um, I then tested the N64. Now, this is a huge asterisk next to this one, because the N64 does not support RGB. I happen to have an RGB modded N64, which is why I was able to use it. Now, if you were to try and connect a, um, a regular N64 to this, uh, I honestly don't know what would happen. I assume it would either pass through composite or S-video through the start port, and you would get some kind of image, but it wouldn't be nearly as good. So, if you are thinking about buying this for the N64, don't. It's a waste. What you should do is upgrade your N64. This is not necessary for that purpose. It will not help you. Um, I then tested it with the Super Nintendo Junior that I have that's RGB modded. Keep in mind that the uh, Super Nintendo Junior did not have RGB. I connected it and it looked phenomenal. I was very happy about that. And then I thought, wait, 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 most people aren't going to have an SNES Junior that's RGB modded. You should use a stock one. So I connected a stock Super Nintendo to see how that would work. And here's where this device gets a huge bonus point. Now, the stock SNES has RGB and it looks okay. I've used it through things like the SCART HDMI device and through the FrameMeister, and the output has always been kind of okay to decent. Um, a lot of the times it suffers from compatibility issues and it, it, does, it never looks quite as good as the SNES Junior that's RGB modded. In this case, it looked almost identical. Uh, so this thing did a very good job handling the Super Nintendo, which is ironic because I read up on this thing in advance and a lot of people said they had massive issues with the Super Nintendo, yet no mention of having issues with the Genesis. Again, your results may vary. Um, so. I then uh, decided to test like a Jaguar, which worked fine. And after I got all those to work, I thought, okay, let's move on to something else. I wanted to test the VGA port. Now, the VGA port, the only thing I tested on it was the Dreamcast, because I wasn't going to bring out the Apple Pippin for this, because I didn't think anybody would really care. But I did test the Dreamcast, because I figured that's the biggest selling point um, to the VGA port for retro gamers is the Dreamcast. Unless you really are in that Apple Pippin community, which, wow, dedication. But, um... I gotta be honest, man, the VGA input from the Dreamcast on this thing, probably the worst I've ever seen the Dreamcast look. Which, I mean, through VGA anyway. That was disappointing. Uh, it, it, and I know I'm not the only one who's talking about this. A lot of people say the Dreamcast looks really bad on this thing. Because it, it creates a lot of unnatural artifacting and it ends up looking really bad. And I also was, I was also noticing a bunch of random like red dots popping up in the frame a lot of the time, almost as if something was corrupted. It was very, very odd. Uh, it, it did not look good, and I definitely, definitely would not recommend this thing for the Dreamcast. Um, there is something coming for the Dreamcast, though, that I would recommend. Probably, we'll see. I'm going to have to review it, but hint, hint. Um, so, yeah, that was a complete wash, in my opinion, the, the uh, VGA input. So then we get to the final thing, which was the component input. Now, again, I wasn't expecting much from this because it's the additional feature, like the VGA, whereas the meat and potatoes, again, is the RGB port. Credit where credit is due. The component input on this thing... Fucking amazing. Fucking amazing. Okay? The FrameMeister, that was like the one thing about the FrameMeister that was actually mediocre to meh, was its component input abilities. This thing does it super well. You know, I plugged the GameCube into it uh, and I ran a 480i on the dashboard and it looked pretty good. It looked much better than it did on the FrameMeister. Then I ran a progressive scan game on it, 480p, and it looked really good. And I was like, wow, because the FrameMeister made it look very muddy and nowhere near as good. Now, the FrameMeister, you can upgrade with profiles and, and get it to look around the exact same, but this thing just did it out of the box, and that was much, much nicer, much more convenient. If this thing had audio inputs for component and HDMI audio out, I would tell you buy it just for the component alone, and then the RGB would be the bonus, and VGA would be, I guess, an extra option. But, alas, it doesn't have that. So if you intend to use this thing with component, which, again, that's honestly, in my opinion, was the best thing about it, um, or at least the big surprise about it, you would still have to go through the problems of dealing with uh, audio issues, which is annoying, and you still, apparently with my setup anyway, could not capture off of it. Now it's worth noting, this is a European device. 
And as a result, that's probably the, the because of the resolutions it's inputting and outputting, etc. Odds are that has something to do with the compatibility issues I was facing. Maybe if you're in Europe and you have European capture hardware, you won't run into these issues. Your results may vary. Um, but yeah, so overall, I would say that this device is very well built. It's nice. Is it a replacement for the frame moisture? I honestly can't say yes to that. Uh, it handles RGB very nicely. It handles components surprisingly nicely. But there are just a lot of quirks that make that are very detrimental to its practical use. Uh, again, if you're the kind of person who keeps your stuff in a, a smaller setup with a computer monitor and separate speakers, this is probably more for you, especially if you don't capture gameplay. But if you're someone like me who does capture gameplay and you have a living room type of setup, this is probably not what you want. Um, but yeah, so in the end, that's what the device is. Not bad at all, but not, not great. I think they're going to make, they already are making like upgraded boards and stuff that have better sound support through the DVI connection. So in theory, in the future, this could be much more useful. But as of right now, I would say hold off maybe until you get future boards. Again, unless you have that PC monitor type of setup. But yeah, so there you go, guys. Thank you, Corey, for hooking me up with this. Thank you guys for watching. I'll see you all later.